So let's talk about ambiguity. When we try to communicate, we usually have one specific point we're trying to get across, clean and clear. But unfortunately, language isn't like that. It's messy and it knocks things over, and a lot of the time it actually ends up picking up a whole bunch of meanings at once. But just because we scatter meanings all over the cosmos doesn't mean the way that we say many things at once is random. I'm O.T. Lieberman, and this is The Ling Space. Welcome to The Ling Space. It's hard to talk about language without starting to notice all the ways ambiguity seeps into our conversations. So, it shouldn't be a surprise that we've discussed it a few times before. Like, there's semantic scope ambiguity in sentences like, every cousin pushed around a ball. That could mean all the cousins pushed around the same giant ball, or it could be they all pushed around separate balls, and the sentence could still be true. Or there's garden path sentences, which can confuse us because they temporarily seem like they go with one meaning, only to end up somewhere else. The prince found all the swans is actually ambiguous. It could be the end of the sentence, or it could keep going with something like, to be very elegant. So the swans could be the object of the finding, or they could be the subject of the relative clause, and there's no way to know unless you get more info. And even just last episode, we talked about word structure ambiguities, or the way a word can mean different things depending on the order you put its component morphemes together. A word like unrollable could mean something that can be unrolled, so unrollable, or something that can't be rolled, so unrollable. So today, we're going to discuss a few more ambiguities we can find out there. But not just that, there must be some cost to dealing with all these meanings getting stuck together, right? How do we learn to deal with this big ball of interpretations, and what do we do with them all? Before we dive into that, let's take a look at some more varieties of ambiguity. One type we haven't touched on yet, which is actually a huge source of puns, is polysemy, or lexical ambiguity, which is when the same string of sounds has more than one meaning. Now, sometimes these meanings can be totally 100% unrelated, just a fluke of linguistic history. Like, think of a word like bowl. Now, this could be something you eat soup out of, but could also be a game with pins. These two senses of bowl are just homonyms. They're written and pronounced the same way, but there's no deeper link. And a lot of words are still ambiguous even if they're spelled differently. Blue and blue, roll and roll, ant and ant, and more. These are known as homophones because they sound alike even if they're written differently. Of course, this sort of polysemy isn't limited to English. So, in French, sans can mean hundred, without, or blood, among others. Or, in Japanese, ha could mean tooth, leaf, or blade. If you think about your languages, you probably won't have to try hard to start coming up with your own examples. But often, there are links between the meanings that different words are attached to. So like for book, the first meaning you might think of is like a tome with pages and writing and all that. But you could also make a reservation or sign a contract, like booking a table at a restaurant. The thing is, that's from someone writing down the information in a book somewhere. It's connected. And some of the most popular English strings of sounds, like run or set, can have hundreds of different meanings. But do these distinctions about how related the forms actually are matter? Well, in 2002, some psycholinguists wanted to look into this, and they performed a series of lexical decision tasks where participants were presented with strings of letters and had to decide as fast as they could whether or not what they were looking at was a word. The researchers included ambiguous words with unrelated meanings, so homonyms like punch and bowl, and words with linked meanings like book and I. And what they found was that connectedness matters. Polysemous words with their line of meanings that run along the same abstract theme are faster to recognize as words. On the other hand, homonyms with their diverse underlying sentences seem to compete with each other. That clash slows down recognizing those strings as words. So whether ambiguous words have linked meanings or not creates a difference in how easy it is for us to pick out words from our mental dictionaries. Another effect of polysemous words is that depending on which interpretation you pick, the structure for the whole sentence may change. Take something like, the astronaut drank the smoothie with lots of zest. Now, this could mean that he did the drinking with a lot of gusto, in which case lots of zest would be telling you about the verb drank. But it could also be that his delicious smoothie has a ton of grated orange peel, which is also known as zest. In that case, lots of zest is telling you about the drink itself. Maybe the astronaut hated all of the zest, but he just drank it anyway. And that's a larger problem with syntactic ambiguities. We can tree up our sentence in multiple ways to give us multiple meanings, but there's no specific reason within the syntax itself to tell you which is better. That zesty sentence we just saw, that's a prepositional phrase, or PP, ambiguity, and they're ridiculously common. You don't need the words in the PP to be particularly polysemous either. Take, the prince found the cousin with the metal detector. This has the same types of interpretations as before. 
Either the cousin has the metal detector and the PP attaches to cousin, or the prince found them with the metal detector and the PP attaches to found. The system itself can't tell you what's really meant. There's no way to tell them apart. And that isn't the only kind of syntactic ambiguity, not by a long shot. Let's consider a sentence like, Marcy met the niece of the queen who liked polka dots. Now, who likes spotted designs here? Well, it depends where you put the relative clause. You could attach it to queen like this, and then you'd have a queen who's a polka dot fan. Or you could attach it to niece like this, and now it's the younger one who's into the dots. And again, there's nothing specific to the syntax that can tell you which of these is better. Which is a problem. Whoever put that ambiguous sentence out into the world, they probably only meant one of the available meanings. So if you want to understand them, we have to do something. Luckily, we have lots of tools for working these things out. And the biggest of these is just looking at the meaning of everything else in the sentence. So let's say a sentence starts, Johnson read the label of the bottle that. Now, if the continuation is, was written in Czech, then that's probably the label because bottles aren't usually written. But if instead the sentence finishes, was filled with melon soda, well, that's probably the bottle. And even much smaller semantic nudges one way or the other can influence what interpretation we come up with. But if pragmatics isn't enough to decide, we still have other tools to fall back on. The prosody of how people pronounce sentences, the length of a given phrase, even the relative size of the pieces you're combining, all of these have been shown to influence interpretations. And beyond any given string of words, we also have parsing preferences about how we approach sentences, even ones we're not sure about. Because we interpret sentences as we encounter the words coming our way, we prefer to check what any given word means and try to satisfy its wordly desires as we go along. That's why our brains tend to stop after a string like, the prince found all the swans, even if it could continue with to be very elegant. Found needs something that finds and something to be found, and once we have those, we try to stop there and not complicate things. How do we even learn these strategies, though? I mean, ambiguity is super everywhere. It's in everything from our morphology to our syntax and semantics. How do kids deal with all this? Well, the answer is that for the most part, they don't. I mean, you can get young kids to notice there are ambiguities sometimes, like with semantic scope. We'll put a link down in the description to something we wrote about that before. But for the most part, kids don't have the processing power to deal with any sort of ambiguity. So for example, Kids under four don't generally seem to get the whole hominin thing well, like that a flying bat and a baseball bat are both pronounced the same way. And that means they have a hard time noticing that a sentence like, the boys saw a bat in the park is ambiguous. They take their preferred reading and they carry it home with them. Of course, it's also noted that many kids around this age suddenly fall in love with puns once they start noticing these ambiguities. This predilection, and also picking up ambiguities like these, seems to go along with kids' reading ability. But once you get beyond words themselves, picking out syntactic ambiguities can be even harder. Like, kids, even through early elementary school, will struggle with telling that sentences like the king talked to the prince with the walkie-talkie are ambiguous. Even if the interpretation they come up with is weird, they have a hard time getting a more realistic reading. Like, when a kid hears chop the tree with the leaves, if they start out thinking the leaves are doing the chopping, they're not like, oh, well, that's weird. Can you even chop things using leaves? Maybe it's saying what tree to chop. They just run with the weirdness. The thinking here is that kids have a really hard time moving off interpretations once they've latched onto them. It actually takes a lot of cognitive energy to roll back over what you came up with, see that it's weird, and then reprocess the sentence. That implies that it's not the ability to come up with both structures that's missing. They just don't have the brain control to fix things they processed wrong, until they're eight or so. Kids may be really good at language things, but they just can't roll with all that ambiguity. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you understood all my meanings, you learned that language shows ambiguity in pretty much all of its systems. That a word with multiple meanings can actually be easier or harder to interpret depending on what those meanings are. That our sentences are filled with syntax that's impossible to resolve even though we try our best and that kids aren't super great at handling ambiguity in their linguistic worlds. The Link Space is produced by me, O.T. Lieberman. It's directed by Delenise Prévost, and it's written by both of us. Our editor is Joris Coulomb, our production assistant is Stefan Herdebees, our music is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier News. We're down in the comments below, or you can bring the discussion back over to our website, where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Also, try dropping by our store, where we have a bunch of cool linguistic stuff. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And we'll see you in two weeks. Ciao, folks,